Well, we, we asked both you guys too, and I'm curious what you would say to what was the number one priority in, in adjustments from Monday to tonight, and then your response to how you felt that worked, whatever the, the game plan in the terms of adjustments was. Did they tell, did they give you any good answers? <laughs> they said, just be more aggressive. Yeah. Um, well, the first thing we talked about was the empty possessions we had offensively in the first game. Uh, we were eight assists, 13 turnovers. And obviously we, we took a major step back in that area. Um, I think I told them after the game that that's the, our effort actually wasn't bad. Um, they, they, they tried in their own ways um, or we tried in our own ways. It was just our execution. And, um, you know, to go from eight assists, which I, I really thought was the, the, if you look at game one, um, the three point shooting was the same. The free throw shooting was the same. The rebounding percentages were about the same. The turnovers were the same. The big thing was, you know, assists. And I think they were 19 and we were eight. And it was just kind of a reflection of their ball movement and our lack of ball movement and kind of watched a lot of clips. Uh, unfortunately, we came out and took an incredibly big step backwards in that regard uh, to go to three assists and 18 turnovers. Um, you're, you're, you're not going to give yourself even remotely a chance to win. So um, that was a big key for us. Ray J. Dennis was the second. I thought we did a much better job on him. It just obviously came at the expense of a lot of other guys. I thought Ray J. was a terrific player in game one. Um, we wanted to go into this game and try and contain and bother him as much as we could. And I think we did a pretty good job of that. They just have so many other weapons. And, you know, in game one, we did a, a decent job on some of those other weapons. And I thought Ray J really controlled the game at both ends. We did a better job of not allowing him to control it tonight. But obviously, the, the, the other guys did a, did a much better job of that. There in the first few games, you had a couple guys who, of course, McQuatch was the first one. But there were a couple guys who looked like they could take over the offense, maybe. Um, today, everyone seemed to be struggling shooting from the field. So was that just Boise State bugging everyone today or what was going on with the offense? Yeah, I, I told the guys after the game, they care. Um, you know, I've had some teams here in the past and I, I've told them, you know, there's some guys that maybe take some shots or, or do some things that aren't what we're asking them to do. And they're doing it for themselves. They weren't doing it, you know, for the team. And I genuinely feel that a lot of these kids – feel as though them trying to go do something, they're really trying to help. They're trying to, to feel like they're going to help us win. Um, it's just really bad offense. And um, right now, offensively, uh, we've just got to become better. We're really young. We're very inexperienced. I can give a lot of reasons of why it looks that way, um, but we have to find a way to get better at that end of the court. It gives us no chance to play defense. Um, and, you know, we were six pick sixes last game. I, God knows how many it was this game, but to go three assists and 18 turnovers, I mean, the rest of the, the stats and parts of the game are, are almost irrelevant because you're just not giving yourself any even remote chance to win. Paul, I know that a blowout loss or two isn't the end of the world uh, this early in the season, but what do you do from here to get this team back on track? I know you come back to Albuquerque for a couple of days. Like, what's the plan? Do you head out to Lubbock this weekend? And just uh, what's, what's it like? Yeah, um, it's probably not a lot of kids that want to hop on that bus, but we're going to have to go back. We, we can't practice in Albuquerque, so we're going to have to get back out to, to Lubbock relatively quickly. Um, and I told them, like, I, I, I love coaching these guys, and, and I love being around them. Um, there's tears in that locker room, and, and, and they love being together, and they love being Lobos, and, and I love coaching them. Um, they're just – they weren't ready for, for this kind of a game. We weren't ready for this kind of a game. We've got to find a way to get ready. I told them I, I can't promise them. I, I can't give them a light at the end of the tunnel. All I can say is we just have to keep working. I know that's not something that um, a young kid in this situation wants to hear, but it's all I got. It's where we're at. And no matter where you're feeling or what you're thinking, we got to get back on that bus. we got to go back out there and, and, and just try and do the best we can and make the rest of this journey the best it can possibly be. Oh, yeah. Go ahead, Jeff. Paul, I know you and I have kind of talked about like sort of the bigger picture things at times and what's going on with all this. But if you guys, I mean, at some point, you're going to have to play the Boise States and the San Diego State. So I'm curious if if you guys aren't ready um, right now and when league play is starting, 
what would it have taken to, to be ready for this? And, and if, if by mid December, if by December 23rd, you're not ready for a game like this, then is, is there a question about whether or not you guys are going to be ready? And if this is the right thing to do and, and those kind of things, because this is the reality, obviously, and you know that as well as anybody. And if you guys are going to be living out of a hotel all season, is this going to be the norm or do you believe that this can change in terms of the competitiveness? Cause these yeah, two nights haven't been competitive. Yeah, it's a good question. And like I just told the guys, we have no other choice. This is it. So um, we, we've got to go back to work. We've got to get ready for the next game. Um, we have to enjoy or at least embrace the process as best as we possibly can. And because these two games didn't go the way anybody would have hoped or expected, that doesn't mean the, the whole world is, is falling apart. That doesn't mean this thing is over. We go back to work and we just see where it goes. I, I don't have a sexy, sweet answer or solution to this other than, like I said, we get back on that bus and, and we go back to work and just see where this season takes us. I don't think that's an answer I can give you right now. And, and it's probably one we'll be able to answer as the season unfolds. Coach, as this game goes along, you know, just with where the team is at, how much are you uh, trying to stick to the original game plan? You know, not trying to give the guys maybe too much information. How much are you letting them try to figure some things out? out? Like, how are you approaching that, you know, as the, the margin got to be where it was? Yeah, it's hard, you know. Um, right now, I, I've told our we – we treat these games almost like a practice. So when we get into a timeout – We've got coaches who are going in and, and teaching. We're, we're, you know, we got a coach going in saying, hey, here's what we, you know, maybe made a mistake on offensively. Here's a defensive coach coming in. Hey, here's where our mistakes are defensively. You know, our timeouts are not maybe a typical timeout that they've been in the past because we're just trying to teach and, and coach. And on the fly like this against a team of this caliber is really challenging to do that. But we're trying to do what we think is best for this group. And all, we, all that is is teaching and coaching every possession. So um, as, as bad as a possession might be or feel, the only thing we can do as opposed to dwelling on it is just coach how it should have been or, or done differently. So um, that's all we're doing right now, coaching and teaching every possession. A lot of our timeouts are unfortunately about the three or four possessions that just happened as opposed to the upcoming ones. But that's just the nature of where we're at. And uh, we, we treat our games kind of like a, a practice to an extent in that that regard. And, and that's all we do. We, we, we did the same thing yesterday when, when we practiced. We taped and we, we had a full practice. And every minute we get with these guys, every possession we get with these guys, we're just trying to get the most out of it we can. Last question, anything else? Um, you're talking about teaching and having to coach them since it is an inexperienced group. I was trying to ask Javante about this. What do practices look like right now? Because you haven't gotten as many practices as you probably would have liked by now. And it is a young group. So are you just kind of going back to the basics and trying to teach them how to play college basketball? Pretty much. I, I think our practices look a lot more like they would in, you know, September or October than they do in the middle of December. I, I told the guys that after game one, a lot of teams would just the following day spend 45 minutes to an hour and walk through some stuff and get shots up and then get ready for a game. Um, we put on tape and had a one and a half hour practice, you know, so we're just in a little bit of a different place and that's okay. I mean, it's just, it's our journey. Uh, everyone this year is kind of going through their own stories, uh, their own experiences. This just happens to be ours. It's a unique one, but one that we need to own and, and do the best that we absolutely can with it.